the whole harm reduction aspect of it is super important um, and, you know, is in essentially all of the work that I do. But what really got me on board was um, that this project aims to, yes, explore what the link is between cannabis and psychosis, but also to remember that some people are there. Some people have used or are using cannabis and have experienced or are experiencing psychosis, and how are we gonna support those people? Um, all too often, the discussion just kind of focuses on the, the before piece and the prevention piece and trying to delay use or you know, try to prevent use completely. And then we have people who are going through sometimes really scary experiences that are left with, with no support. Um, sometimes also a feeling of blame that you know, because you smoked cannabis um, or, you know, used weed in another way, um, you had a psychotic episode and that's on you. And the, the reality is that there are a slew of other factors that come into play. And um, it's really unfair to just reduce the conversation to just cannabis and psychosis. So this project is so interesting because it's more holistic, looks at mental health beyond just psychosis and, um, takes into account kind of these, these, these other factors, the before, the after, and truly comes from a place of compassion and support. Oh man, that's, <laughs> that's tough because I really, I try to not give an answer that's just, it depends, because that's usually not helpful for people who are actually looking for, you know, concrete things to think about. Um, I would, I'll start with, you know, if people are using right now, and um, it's probably still not helpful because my first instinct is to think maybe it's related to your mental health and maybe it's not. There are a lot of ways that people can use. They're kind of absent from, from these discussions about cannabis use, um, especially in youth, is the idea of fun and using just for pleasure and have it stop there. Um, I think that we kind of know it intuitively, but the idea of young people, you know, using, using a drug and having it just be kind of, um, that's just it, they use it once in a while and they have a good time and that's it, um, is also something that I, that I don't want to erase from the picture because that's some people's experience and if you try to just medicalize that or if you try to kind of push that everyone is coping with something and that's why they're using weed, um, then that's just not some people's reality. Uh, so in that, in that situation, um, or you know, sometimes it's also a physical mental, uh, sorry, a physical health symptom that people will be treating with cannabis. Um, and of course the physical will kind of feed back into your mental health. Um, but medicalizing cannabis is kind of how we got to legalization. Right, M making cannabis go from this kind of delinquent, hippie associated drug to, oh, this drug actually has medical benefits. And so we see the legitimacy of it to, well, okay, we're also paying attention to the harms of prohibition and criminalizing um, use and having the harms of criminalizing use outweigh the actual risks that use might have. Um, so it's true that we've come from using medical uses as a way to understand drug use, but now more and more the conversation just gets more complicated. Talking about fun, talking about um, social connection ways of using um, is also important. But um, a, a lot of research on the motives for use shows that coping is a really prominent reason for use. So that's definitely not to be disregarded either. Um, using cannabis with relation to your mental health, um, it, it can go both ways is probably one of of the things that I would say, maybe your cannabis use will come after something that's happening with your mental health, but it can also loop back into worse mental health or it can help you. Um, and so I would say that it's, it's never just about those two things. It's never just about the cannabis and your mental health. Um, there will always be other things at play and um, thinking about your cannabis and your mental health as a place to start. 
I think that's what I would probably, that would probably be how I sum it up. And then, but it's not the end of it either. Yeah, and it's the same message as would be beneficial for other drugs, which is so important to realize that, you know, we talk about cannabis, sometimes we'll kind of bring alcohol into the mix as well um, in terms of the parallels that we draw, uh, tobacco as well, but really um, centering a harm reduction approach where we have decades of um, research uh, showing that just say no approaches don't work and that um, harm reduction approaches do, right? Um, it's not just that we have this one thing that doesn't work, so we're trying this new thing. We actually do have a lot of evidence to support a harm reduction approach. Um, and cannabis, uh, you know, we'll, we'll hear about cannabis as a gateway drug to other drugs, um, and it's, that's a theory that has been disproven. But cannabis... Uh, policy is kind of a gateway to, or I would say cannabis discussions are a gateway to having other drug discussions. And that's a really positive aspect of legalization is that we kind of threw ourselves into a situation where the issue was there. The question of legalization and of cannabis and of use and non-use and reasons for use um, all had to come to the forefront. So now drawing parallels and kind of applying that same logic to other substances and having a more holistic method of looking at what's your, what's your use like, how does that relate to your mental health, what are the other substances that you use, how, do, how does your use of those substances relate to your mental health, but also other things like your social location and what you're going through in your life. Um, so it's really, it's so exciting in terms of that, in terms of just having open discussions, um, you know, at the dinner table, at home with your family, or on the international scene politically, and, um, you know, at the UN, these, these are big discussions. So, uh, yeah, I would say that it, it's opened a lot of really, um, a lot of doors that lead to meaningful, relevant, and needed conversations. Part of it is that youth empowerment goes such a long way. Um, part of what prevents young people from getting as involved as potentially they would like to is, in my opinion, the, the, the biggest barrier is just not knowing about opportunities. And I would say that the main way that you learn about opportunities is through your friends and your peers and you know, hearing about what other people are up, up to. Maybe they hear about your interests and tell you about an opportunity. So, even just the fact of us having a, you know, essentially completely youth-led project means that that's already that many young people who can connect other people to opportunities and ways to actually really concretely have a voice and uh, an impact. So even, you know, let alone the subject matter that we're dealing with, just in terms of having young people be involved and feel like they have a say, um, it can be really frustrating nowadays to feel like you're uh, dealing with a world that has repercussions of things that you had no part in, like climate change, um, and having feeling like you do have a role and you can do something is really helpful, I think, especially now. Um, so that's even not even talking about the cannabis part. Um, but then in terms of drug policy, um, or cannabis in particular now, uh, it's, it hasn't been all that long that young people have had this type of voice. Um, young people have uh, essentially throughout all of history, but especially during the D.A.R.E. program and Just Say No, um, youth have been seen as an audience to receive knowledge. and we're seeing more and more that um, pieces of knowledge translation or resources or just documents and products that are created by people who are not youth, for youth, um, it's always very transparent. So people can either make a document that is kind of classic adult, um, by adults, for adults type of material that youth are just having access to, or adults can make, I'm talking about adults as in, you know, people who are above 30. So obviously there's a 12 year period there that you're kind of in the transition period. Um, 
but then you can also have adults who are making products that are for young people, and that is almost always so transparently out of touch with what young people will respond to. We've seen that a lot with social media and how some campaigns just haven't engaged with social media very much and are still using exclusively print materials to try to get a message across, and that's not effective. It's just not going to work, and... Um, we can either move forward with how knowledge translation and um, research and uh, knowledge creation is going, or we can watch. But there's no, you know, those are kind of the two options that we're at right now. So I think that that's really why it's so important to have young people intimately involved in every piece, every decision, um, because if you're if you're creating a product, like a knowledge product, where you're making, let's say, an infographic or a one-pager about something, and um, you know that's that's that decision was made uh, that and it wasn't in consultation with youth. Um, yeah, youth can contribute to making that resource, that one-pager, but maybe. If, to begin with, it wasn't a one-pager that was needed. Maybe a video that you put on social media would have been much more engaging, but even that decision-making process wasn't in consultation with youth, and so you don't get that piece. Um, you just get it kind of at the end of your project. So we're making sure that we're involving young people every step of the way so that every piece of this project speaks to young people. Um, and it's really... It's really cool to see uh, how fast this has moved forward in terms of having young people, giving young people a voice, and taking seriously what, people, what young people have to say. Um, that's not a given. Uh, young people are at you know, some decision-making tables sometimes as a token, as kind of to say we did it, but their ideas aren't implemented. So that's what full youth engagement is.